Suppose a wind is blowing from the direction north, 45 degrees west, at a speed of 50 kilometers per hour. A pilot is steering a plane in the direction of north, 60 degrees east, at an airspeed of 250 kilometers per hour. Find the true course and ground speed of the plane, which is the vector sum of the velocity vectors. So this is a fun problem, has bearings in it, and really good applications of vectors. So we're going to see why we should care, why we would ever use vectors. So let's start with this bearing of the wind from the direction north 45 degrees west. We have to read carefully. It says a wind is blowing from this direction. So north, south, west, and east. I started north and I go 45 degrees west. So this vector for the wind is right here. Okay. A pilot is steering a plane in the direction of north, 60 degrees east. So I started north and I go 60 degrees in the direction of east. And the airspeed is 250 kilometers per hour, so I'm going to make it longer than this one. Not to scale, but this is what, 50, so this should be like five times as long. It won't be because my picture is off a little bit, but this gives us a basic idea. And this is the velocity of the plane. So the wind is blowing from this direction, and the pilot is steering the plane in this direction. So let's label our angles. So what's happening here? I know the plane is trying to fly at the bearing north, 60 degrees east, but the wind is going to be pushing on that plane. So let's think about when we first learned about vector addition and we did it geometrically. I can actually think about this vector, VW, my vector with my wind, as pushing down on the plane. So the vector is really like pushing right here, pushing that plane down, but if I were actually to add the vectors, I would actually, I wouldn't draw it like that, but do y'all see that this is going to push down and this vector is actually going to be a little bit lower? But if I look at my vector addition, I see it actually looks like this. So my resultant vector will be somewhere from my original initial point to this new terminal point, like something like this. So this red vector will be my resultant vector. What's really happening? Again, my picture's not to scale, but this at least gives us an idea of what's happening. So, let's try to figure out what to do. Let's start with the velocity of the wind. Okay, so I want to compare my velocity vector to um, the x-axis, I want to make a triangle, but I need to be careful. I want to make sure that my initial point is at is on the x-axis. So I can think about just moving my wind instead of having it go from some point out here and end up at zero zero. I can draw it like this. Okay. So if I draw it like that. I know I have 45 degrees, and I can find um, the sides of my triangle. Remember that I can call this A and I can call this B, but this hypotenuse is always going to be the magnitude of my velocity vector. So in this case, my magnitude was what? Speed was 50 kilometers per hour, so this will be 50. So when we Hopefully, remember that we can write a vector in terms of its components, but also in terms of an angle theta. So I can look at the magnitude of my vector times cosine theta. That's the x component. And the magnitude of the vector times sine theta gives me my y component. So let's look at this. The issue, though, is I need to figure out, I need to know what theta is. For my wind, I see that my theta here is actually going to be negative 45 degrees if I measure it from the x-axis. I could also go all the way around if I wanted to and say 135 degrees. 
but I'll go ahead and use this. So a magnitude of V is 50. And I have cosine of negative 45 degrees, comma, 50 sine of negative 45 degrees. Now I've done enough trig to know that cosine of 45 degrees and sine of 45 degrees is root 2 over 2. I just need to adjust the signs and make sure I know what quadrant I'm in. So if I am in quadrant 4, I know cosine should be positive and sine should be negative. So this will be 50 and then multiply by root 2 over 2 and then I'll have 50 and since it's sine and sine is negative here, I know that's negative root 2 over 2. So I end up with the vector 25 root 2 and then negative 25 root 2. That's the vector representing the wind. Now let's do the vector representing the plane. Very similar. Let's show over here and just draw you another triangle just with the vector in the plane. So I know this is some um, A value, this is some B value, and this length is the magnitude of that vector. So it's an airspeed of 250 kilometers per hour, so this is 250. So I get 250. Oh, and theta was 30 this time. My picture's not to scale, I apologize for that. So 250 cosine 30 degrees, and then 250 sine 30 degrees. Well, I know 30 degrees is pi over 6, so that's root 3 over 2 and 1 half, cosine comma sine, so that's 250 times square root of 3 over 2, and then 250 times 1 half, You should be always checking me on your paper as well. So this is 125 root 3, excuse me, and 125 like this. Now I have written the velocity vector for the wind and for the plane in component form. Now I want to add them up. I want to see what happens when I combine them geometrically. We kind of visualize what was going on in this big picture. But let's see what happens if I do it algebraically now. If I combine these vectors, if I add them. So let me scroll down. Let's look at that resultant vector. It's going to be the sum of my wind vector plus my plane vector. And I would add up each component. It's not going to combine very nicely. And I'm just going to give you a decimal approximation. This is approximately 251.86 and looks like 89.64. Going back to the question, find the true course and ground speed of the plane. Okay, so how do I find the ground speed? I know what the vector looks like, but to find the ground speed, I'm going to need the magnitude of that vector. Remember, I can also write magnitude with double bars. Okay, so this is going to be 251.86 squared plus 89.64 squared, and I take a root of that. And looks like that turns out to be 267.34 kilometers per hour. That's the ground speed. I also want the true course. 
So let's draw another triangle. I have something over here. Not to scale, but that's okay. So let's call this theta 1. If I drop perpendicular down, I know that this length right here is 251.86, and this length right here was 889.64. I can figure out what theta is. If I know what theta 1 is, then I can say, well, this is 90 degrees minus theta 1, and that will give me a bearing from north. So let's figure out what theta 1 is first. So tangent theta 1 is 89.64 divided by 251.86. To solve for theta 1, take the inverse tangent. Looks like theta 1 is approximately 19.6 degrees. Okay, well that's just this angle here. I want a bearing, so I'm going to do 90 degrees minus 19.6 degrees, and I get 70.4 degrees. So the true course is north 70.4 degrees in the direction of east.